Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today's Fireside Chat. Today, we'll talk about the cross-border investment opportunities in China. My name is Dr. Ella Li, CEO of Hanghai Belt Labs and the founding partner of M7 Ventures. And I'll be your moderator for this Fireside Chat. Now, I'm very honored to introduce our speaker and a good friend of mine for this topic, Mr. Raymond Yang. Raymond is the co-founder and the managing partner of West Summit Capital, the leading global VC firm with teams and the investment across China, Silicon Valley, and Europe. Prior to West Summit, Raymond was the founding partner of Taishan Investor AG, one of the most established institutional angel investment fund in China, and was the managing partner of Navi Capital Partners, and a venture partner at Northern Light Venture Capital, the leading tech VC uh, fund in China. Meanwhile, Raymond also serves many other roles. He's a distinguished delegate to the World Economic Forum Global Agenda Council, former chairman of the prestigious Tsinghua University Entrepreneur and Executive Club, which is also known as a TIG and the vice chairman of China Venture Capital and the Private Equity Association, head of Tsinghua North America Education Foundation, etc. Again, today's topic is uh, cross-border investment in China. Without further ado, let's welcome Raymond. Thank you so much, Ila. And it is my great honor to be here to share some of my uh, humble view with you guys. Thank you, thank you, Raymond. So now as the founding partner of the very famous West Summit Capital and also a very established and also well-known uh, venture capital list, uh, you have many successful exits, including Unity and also Twitch. Uh, interestingly, you changed your investment strategy several years ago now uh, by focusing on Chinese market. Can you please share your journey? Well, if I have to make a joke at the very beginning by saying the the robber the, the reason the, the robbery robbed the bank because that's where the money is, which means the VC should always chase in where the investment opportunity and in, which means where the money is. That's where uh, we we saw in probably 2018 or before the there's a pretty major shift uh, in the China comp uh, investment landscape that from the so-called the B2C business model, i.e. internet, mod, uh, mobile, and consumer play to the more and more technology innovation play in China due to the uh, two major reasons. One is, as you know, that the so-called the geopolitical dynamics globally or internationally, China versus, you know, uh, in, in this global situation. And also the the time, the urgency for so-called the upgrade, industry upgrade, meaning people or industry or economy in China could not simply rely on so-called the traditional way of cheap labor or land or creating air pollution and so on and so forth to change the opportunities for industry or for economy growth. They have to move to something more technology driven which actually plays very much strength in the way of the West Summit has been doing for over a decade. We start our fund 2010 with a very specific focus and mandate, which is the uh, investing into the technology. Uh, when I say technology uh, by, by West Summit, we also mean deep tech or versus consumer tech, uh, i.e. TikTok uh, of the world. And if you imagine that back to 2010, who would invest into some deep tech stuff in China? Because everybody else is focusing on that. So we said that finally, after long, long, lonely journey of our sort of many years of focusing on tech, which we achieved a great uh, return on our financial, I mean, fund investment. I think this is the time for us. That's why we say let's focus on that. Certainly. As you know that we, we most of our team are coming uh, basically you know from China we have very very strong foothold there so that gave us the uh, uh, opportunity we think we have to get this this opportunity that's where the uh, the reason we start to refocus in 
completely China. Certainly, we are very much welcome for any opportunities that if there is something cross border come from Silicon Valley or US, you know, they, they see uh, China as a market opportunity or anything else. That's also in the scope of our uh, investment. Uh, now, now I think what interests most of uh, not only uh, investors but also entrepreneurs um, is how does investment in China different from that in U.S. For instance, from your let's say as a um, is in investors' perspective, how is the exit time strategy different or? valuation of the company, ways to interact with the company, culture difference, how is that a different in these two regions? Yeah, that's a, Ila, that's a very, that's an excellent question. I think there's a, there's a lot, lots of different, I will try to pick up a, a few to share with, uh, with you, you here. First of all, I have to say that it's so interesting because I've been, uh, uh, I've been working and investing uh, in both sides of the, uh, you know, the Pacific, uh, i.e. Silicon Valley and China, I've been constantly compare, compared to see the, see the difference between here and there. The number one thing come up to my mind as always is the, I definitely view Silicon Valley uh, as the, I would say the birthplace or birth bed for innovation. You, you, you just look at all these technology trends and the waves, doesn't matter that's, uh, you know, cloud computing, big data, you know, the, uh, you know, SaaS, and you name that, everything, pretty much AI and the machine learning, everything you, you, you name that, that's created from here and been adapted in China. But on the other hand, I would, I would definitely view China is more on the application side, which means innovation here in the US and the application because the, mar the huge market in China, and also the, the willingness for e either from the individual and to the corporations there are willing to embrace the anything new in the technology. And so that's a, that's a very interesting uh, sort of a dynamic if you compare with, uh, uh, with that. So for example, the, uh, the facial recognition in China today is like everywhere in my, in my office. I never have to bring my badge car, go there, you know, look at that the little camera and then boom, the door is open. And actually even on my uh, building access, meaning my office building of, of access, and there's so many uh, applications people adapt that. And, and interesting enough that uh, in China, if some company, they try to talk to uh, VCs like us, they often to say, we are something, someone, something, something, someone, someone of United States. For example, they will say something, oh, we're the MongoDB of, of China. We're the service now of China. We're someone, someone of China, which immediately bring them to a certain, you know, pretty, I would say prestige level and then to get attention. Sometimes you have to tell this is true or not, but the, you, you can imagine that the way of people of, of doing that. Uh, number two, actually, uh, interesting enough, uh, because I invest uh, many companies, I've invested many companies in the Valley. One thing that I've, I've been observe, observed is that in the Valley, at least for a long time, the people, especially from VC points of view, they, when they look at the management of company, they do see, so they do see the group of entrepreneur founders they're the so-called founders. At a certain stage, they're going to bring into so-called uh, uh, professional managers to keep a company grow. And even maybe at the stage of the pre-IPO, they bring into the CEOs that would be able to lead the company to deal with the public uh, company's dynamic, so on and so forth. But in China, it's opposite. You don't see changing management every you know, uh, all the time. So basically, I would say the founders and the, the entrepreneurs who do or die with the company. If you go all the way, either you make it if you, or you fail. So that's uh, if you change the CEO or founder, that will create huge uh, issues. That, that's kind of an uh, interesting observation in China. So which means when, you're making, uh, when you are making investment, you have really, really uh, to look at the, the management team to see whether those guys not only create the early stage uh, companies' products, so on and so forth, are are they uh, are they able to make really good company eventually to the uh, the state of a you know, public to be become public company? 
And uh, on, on the other hand, Chinese companies are tend to be running on the way of a more a lean and mean, which means that very often for the similar stage of the companies, let's say series B or C or, or something, quite often you can see company become profitable or EBITDA positive in China, that which is not quite often that we've seen in, in China, uh, in US. Uh, uh, meaning, you know, another thing is that you don't see startup companies in China have something titled called CFO, which you know, every one of our startups here in the Valley, we must have one, even maybe from day one. When the uh, Chinese hire a uh, company, hire CFO, probably like uh, what, a month, uh, a year before they go to IPO. So before that, they, they may have just like a financial director or something. You no, know, again, this is an interesting, uh, you know, uh, situation. In the way, you know, when we talk to some startups in the in in the U.S., we we see full team of you know CEOs, CEO or president, VP sales, VP sales, VP marketing, VP engineer. So on and so forth. But in China, normally you probably see two or three of key founders and then there's some other uh, lower level. Uh, very, uh, very interesting. Another thing different uh, that's in, the, in, the, in China is that uh, China has lots of government money, especially from the local, uh, we call the Science and Technology Park uh, and it's sponsored by the local uh, municip municipal governments. They want to uh, attract startup companies to their uh, region or cities, therefore, by offering some uh, 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 capital, mainly in RMB, not in US dollar. And then certainly they give some other benefit like tax uh, holidays and so on and so forth. So there's a pros and cons in, in the way we see that because those are the money not necessarily considered as the smart money because the, the knowledge behind the money may not be as good as the professional investment. Uh, so that may mess up the, the situation, create a more competitive situation. But on the other hand, for some startups, if they have, they're in the situation, they'll have a hard time to raise money if uh, this may give them a, a, a life, another life. So, you know, there's a pros and cons. Uh, another interesting, quite much comparison is that if you have to look at the U.S. Uh, investment landscape, I probably will see more in the software, you know, like a cloud computing software, so on and so forth. In, but in China, it's still mainly in hardware, i.e. semiconductor, robots, uh, mobile phone ecosystem, and uh, also uh, EV, meaning electronic vehicles uh, ecosystem, uh, industry, uh, for that all those kind of things is more toward hardware. Uh, the enterprise software market landscape in China are coming up, but not not as as mature as that in the in the valley. I will probably give it another five to eight years to reach to the level of the what the Silicon Valley or U.S. that has. So there's a, probably a two generation at least uh, behind what's going on in the Silicon Valley. Uh, Another thing is that uh, China has uh, about a few years ago created something they call Starboard, uh, which is equivalent to the NASDAQ. That meaning the, the deep tech, the technology companies can go public listing without being to be profitable. Uh, for a long, long time, if you're not profitable, or if you're not profitable for continuous for three years, you're not qualified for listing on, on the, on the uh, on a stock uh, exchange. But this star board creates this opportunity, which gave the opportunity for a uh, tech company to get public list sooner and easier. On the other hand, it definitely gave, give, give it a more higher PE and PIS multiples, meaning the same company, if you listen on, on star board, it probably the overall valuation or market cap will be higher than that. Otherwise, in China or in, in uh, that was otherwise in U.S. or in Hong Kong. Yeah, I, I, the last but not least is the China has a little the the investment landscape has little M merger acquisition M and A, but more IPO where you just go under. And certainly here in the U.S., you see you know balance of the uh, M A opportunities versus IPO opportunities.
Yeah, I, I would probably just that's quite about the uh, the one I see. So generally speaking, would you say, like, say, if you look at the valuation of the company for life science, uh, life science uh, sector, um, Raymond, uh, uh, companies in China uh, usually value much higher um, to that in the United States. Um, how is that in, let's say, TMT sector? No, that's what actually what I'm saying. The TMT sector, uh, medical care, uh, tech sector, the overall valuation in China, if you list it, it would be higher than otherwise lives in US. I yeah. think there's a, there's a momentum there. People love this kind of uh, companies and also with the government support and people see, oh, this will be representing a huge market opportunity and huge growth. And uh, that's, that's, that's probably the reason, yeah. Mm. So uh, if you compare, for instance, the particular industry or vertical, let's say, um, can you can you say, uh, for instance, which vertical in China has a better leverage compared to that in the United States? Or in other words, what are the uh, investment opportunities in um, China now and also moving forward? Well, I, I will give you what we are focusing on, which I believe uh, not totally, but actually representing quite a, a, a major chunk of the, the opportunities you're talking about. Basically, West Summit, uh, we have four uh, industry sectors uh, of, of our focus, uh, which means uh, semiconductor. And uh, number one, number one, number two, we have a, a advanced manufacturer. I will come back for the more detail. And the third is called enterprise software. And then the fourth one is called emerging technology. Uh, I will see today, if you are going to China, ask everyone to say, what is the hottest sector in China for investment or for startup, the answer would be semiconductor, which if you look at the here in the valley, you know, I, I, I came to the valley about 30 years ago. The, 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 at that time, there were still VCs investing to be a, a semi a business, but nowadays you just don't see that many or if, if any. But in China, that's huge. And not only that, but also it gave you um, if you're able to be a public company for a semi company, absolutely you get you, you get much higher multiples in the market cap than otherwise you have the same company listing on the Nasdaq. That's that's just very very uh, very uh, clear and because again that's where people have this sort of a, a strong belief. And other things like uh, if you have a deep tag and if you have a uh, high uh, high growth that would definitely get, give you the higher um, I would say either PEPS multiples or the the market cap. Uh, Medicare is another thing is very hot. People and the, and the people love that uh, that area because you just think about this 1.4 billion you know, population in China people the aging uh, population issue so on and so forth. That's another very hot sector. Uh, so. Basically, if you have to ask me what's the three major categories or area of for investment opportunity in China, I will say that number one definitely is the technology. And number two is healthcare. Number three is what we call the uh, big consumer, meaning the, everything that to do with consumer. People even try to create the so-called the Coca-Cola of, of, of China, or some kind of beverage, something, or people even invest into the restaurants, like a, like a, a chain restaurant, so on and so forth. Uh, but government-wise, they're very much encouraged and support the deep tech and the Medicare. And the recent regulatory change in China, if you have heard about that, that's more on the crackdown on the so-called internet platform, especially like a and finance the you know, sub, um, subsidiary of the uh, Alibaba and also Meituan. So governments start to shift the, the support of those companies. Uh, certainly you can, you can see it by the, uh, their stock market price uh, to the more the uh, so-called the deep tech uh, areas. Those are very valuable information. Now I'm gonna ask you one um, billion dollar equivalent, you know, like a, a question. So what uh, is the key to be successful investing in China? Well, that's a, that's a very, uh, let me give you something uh, at a very high level. 
You know what? In the last 20 years, uh, starting from 2000, as I said, 2018 to 2019, again, that was the more the so-called internet business model, B2C. If you are asking for every investor in China, say, oh, where, which sector area are, are you investing? The answer would be TMT, right? So then when I say, wait a minute, TMT, T what's a TMT? TMT is everything. So which means the investor in the past, you can do more, I would say, holistic, uh, horizontal, almost like you're seeing uh, family doctors. You have a generalist, you have a specialist doctor, right? You, you say, okay, I have somewhere I don't feel comfortable and doctors say, okay, doing this, doing that. Versus, oh, I have a dental issue, I have a vision issue, I have a whatever, uh, ch children, child, something, then you have to go to a specialist. The similar situation in China, I see if you want to be a great, good investor, that you need a shift from being a generalist to be specialist or shift being, uh, being a sort of more horizontal play, meaning you invest everything versus you have to be really much focused in one particular area, become the expert. Think about that. In the past, if you want to say invest into, let's say TikTok or something kind of mobile, whatever app, like a DoorDash kind of thing, like a May Twan. I mean, you can cover lots and lots of areas, but now you're coming today, you say, I'm going to invest into semiconductor. Then let me ask you something called FPGA. How, how much people would understand that, right? Then I would say, okay, let's take, talk about NoSQL database. How many, how many, if you are not an expert, how can you pick up the winners there. So that's what, what I'm saying at a very general level. And at the more execution level, we have uh, summarized uh, probably four or five areas. Number one, we call the, you, uh, you have to be, you have the ability to find good deals. For us, we call, you, you are able to, adapt, I mean, finding the deals, right? Meaning that's the deal source become super, super important. Number two, you have to understand the deals, meaning sometimes, as I mentioned, there, there are some very, the technology the deals at a certain stage, if you're not expert, even in an area I know you're, you're good at, meaning the medical tech, you know, if you ask me to do that, there's no way I can, I can be winner uh, investors. So uh, this is meaning you need a strong domain knowledge, expertise, and so on and so forth. The third area is that the ability to secure a deal, a deal, which means similar here in the Valley, meaning when you come there, you ask a question about why the entrepreneur startup would, would take your, your check versus Sequest versus some other top tier. In China, you have to, to be like that too, meaning how can you secure, secure the, the great deals? And then the number four is the post investment the investment value, uh, value added, meaning once you become an investor, how can you help the company to bring the value to the, to the business? As you know, that's very often the entrepreneur, they, they have a great idea where they're, they were probably coming from engineer background, but then how can you grow from a product or into the company or in the company to be a really full-fledged companies? You have to bring into their lots of lots of uh, values to the company. But the not last but not the least, is the, you have to manage the exit. I, I will tell you the story that one company we invest in China in the semiconductor business called Giga Device, which is uh, in the area of the uh, uh, memory chips uh, in the North Flash area. We, uh, the company, we invest company in 2011, company went public 2016, uh, at a valuation of, uh, I would say, let me, like 200, uh, uh, like let's say two, 20 billion RMB, which like what? Um, give me one second. That's like a probably Three. 300, 300 yeah. million US dollar, right? So, something like that, yes. So then at the time people, everybody was pretty, I mean, every, all the investors been there for years and years were so thrilled. They said, oh my God, finally the day has come. We, we, we sold, they sold the shares. And we look at the whole situation. I mean, we certainly, we sit on the board, we know what's going on, we help the company. We have a whole very, very strong belief for the future of the company. We hold shares, not selling anything. Two years later, the company reached the valuation 
almost to 20 billion, to 20 billion. Think about that. That's how many times of the, that's after company went public, which means not only you are able, you, you are able to invest into a good company, but you also need to know when would be a good time to exit. So otherwise you make, that, that make a huge difference. So that's pretty much the, uh, <laughs> the way to answer your question, yeah. That's all the lifetime experience coming from yeah. a successful investor. So um, I know this topic could really expand it to like all day long, but thank you for the highlight. Um, so my next question is a lot of uh, U.S. company, when they talk about entering into ch entering Chinese uh, market, the first question or reaction is always, okay, so what about this uh, potential patent uh, infringement or all this regulatory issue or regulatory hurdles in China? Can you share your thought and also give some advice to those companies? Yeah, I think the first of all, you know, again, uh, interesting enough, giving this again, geopolitical tension globally, uh, Chinese government and whole China is still quite welcome to foreign investment and also the companies. I mean, they're especially go local again at, at the municipal science park, uh, technology park, those people there, they're, they're so thrilled to see some kind of a hard tech company, uh, companies, uh, foreign company come to sort of to land there. Uh, so, However, if you go there, the actually interesting enough, that's where the, uh, the thought on the IP issue, it becomes, so, uh, at least to me, it's become less and less a concern. Uh, number one, for the past so many years, the IP issue has, Chinese government has given so much attention and enforcement for the IP issue. I'll put it in a very simple way. If you, if you do something terribly wrong on the IP, you can be in the jail. I mean, that's, that's no kidding. It's not like, oh, you know, you do whatever you like. Also, uh, on the other hand, you, you talk about almost every successful company in China nowadays are sort of a one way or another sponsored or invested by the VCs. So if you are sponsored by the VCs, that would change the mindset of the entrepreneurs. Also the board, you know, if I were board member on company, I do not want to see my company has this kind of issue, which will get them in trouble, right? So it's almost like a VC money, besides government, become, becomes another enforcement for the company to follow the right way to do their own innovation, you know, so on and so forth. Oh, by the way, the total number, I, I don't quote me on exactly number, but I think the total number of IP application out of China uh, has surpassed of that in the, in the U.S., meaning they create more and more IP their own. So I think the challenge for foreign companies go to China nowadays is more how to, again, how to adapt the local market needs. The market needs can be quite different, especially if you're providing something more at the application level. That can be because culture issue, the regular, regulatory uh, issue. That it could be you have to, uh, change that a little bit. If you're providing under uh, beneath uh, technology, like a database or like some kind of hardware, that's a less less an issue. So that's uh, uh, that's about the situation. Yeah. I see. Um, I know we are uh, uh, running a, a little bit um, out of time now, but uh, um, I really want to ask you, which is also my favorite question. So in your investment career. What is the biggest challenge or hurdle you ever had? And if you could come back, what could you have done different? Well, actually, uh, uh, I, to be honest, for the, our own investment, I do not have a, uh, well, it doesn't mean I don't have a challenge there. Like everybody has that one, but that's, that's actually, it's nothing. But the more sort of a things that bothers us, it's more the, at the macro level. Today, I think there's probably, you know, two or three major things uh, for the past years. Number one is the, the government, uh, the policy regulatory change. Uh, in, the, in that situation, for example, if they, the government, for example, you know that the, not quite long ago, uh, Chinese government has a certain regulatory change to cracking down on the so-called post school tutoring, tutoring program. If you look at this called a new oriental and, and, and VIP kids of the world, right? It's like a, 
tons of money invest into this so-called education uh, market is got all crashed. It crashes like over, almost like overnight. So lots of investors are not able to pull out their money before the thing happened. But luckily, because you know we are not investing into those, those sectors, we uh, there's you know there's no no harm, no impact for us. But I'm trying to say that you need to be really watching or beware of the government regular uh, just major major. Uh, duration and since I know you, Eli, you're in the uh, medical area. The Chinese government recently uh, launched a new program, which I think, well, by the way, I think this uh, post-school cracking down on post-school children program is is great thing to do because you know what? Uh, that number one, it creates certain uh, social so so-called social unfairness issue, meaning they drag the uh, they attract lots of money. To those sectors, make the public school teachers are become uh, weaker and weaker, which is not fair for the people who are relatively underprivileged. Number one, number two, uh, that creates certain anxiety for the, the young generation uh, parents, which means they say, you know, after their kids' school, they have to take them into different different kind of a programs. Is so much a burden, which also come back to hurting them in two things. Number one, certainly hurting the birth rate. Right, because the people say I'm not going to have my second kid or say third kid, because even one kid that's that's enough for me. Number two, if you spend more money on those things, and then you're spending less money on any other things for economy growth, right? You probably could be on vacation, or we'll go to movies, or we'll go to restaurant, or something, something else. You know, I mean, when you develop an economy, government wants to you have more money on those things, but now that that sucks into the, all the you know, expen uh, expensive uh, the, the daily office, uh, uh, daily families, that's not good. So that's why I say that that's good. I mean, actually, we don't see much in the U.S. here. There are a little bit of this so-called uh, post-school uh, uh, tutoring. The second thing is I'm talking about the medical and uh, healthcare uh, industry. Government launched a new thing called the uh, centralized the, uh, procurement, which means they will use the, they will call all the medical, uh, pharmaceutical companies come here and say, okay, you know, you know what, from now on, uh, I want the, the medicine or the drug price come to this, this level, would you be in or not? If you're not in, you're out. Otherwise, I only give you a certain percentage uh, margin on top of that. Certainly, I will buy volume, huge volume uh, out of you. So that's another thing. If you're in that business, you have to make an investment, you make a financial forecast, all of a sudden, boom, you know, this thing comes to you. That's a that's a pretty big impact. Again, we are not in that investment, but still that's something. Uh, on the other hand, the 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 dynamic like this, but also certainly also in the dynamic in this so-called geo geopolitical. Uh, dynamics, in, in, including some sanctions that the gov U.S. government uh, towards some Chinese companies, make the LPs are very nervous. There's a, oh, wait a minute, I'm not sure what's going on there. So, you know, where I should hold to see what's going on, so on and so forth. That's kind of a big, one of the biggest challenges, even though for us, we see we're less impact. We're, and also, you, you look at every fund goes for 10 years. It's not about this year. Next year is a long way to go. But still, that's a, that's the issue we have to you know convince investors for the you know continue to uh, invest into the uh, GPs. Again, this is not my specific uh, challenge. It's a, it's a challenge for everybody in China. Yeah. Wow, so much valuable and also helpful information. Thank you so much, Raymond. Um, now we come to the end of this Fireside chat, and I would like to thank Rima again for your wonderful, great insights and also thoughts. Hope our audience find this action being helpful. Thank you so much again, Rima. Thank you so much, and also thank you for everyone to give me this opportunity. <laughs>